Thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited to bring you our second in a series of Emory Explores Executive Insights webinar series. The Emory Alumni Association together with Poizueta Business School, Poizueta Executive Education Programming, and the Emory Corporate Partner Program is proud to deliver this in-depth series presented by our, our exemplary faculty and executive thought leaders on how executives must adapt to a changing business landscape. With the COVID pandemic upon us, we see it quite fitting to move forward in launching the series by addressing what it means to practice business during this and eventually after a public health pandemic and how we lead in uncertainty. Two pieces of housekeeping, this is being recorded. So for any reason you need to step away from your device, we'll send the full recording to you tomorrow. Um, and also please uh, feel free to chat your questions in the Q&A box to our presenters and we're gonna get to as many of those as we can at the end. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Nicola Barrett, to introduce our presenters. Thank you, Lane. Uh, I'm Nicola Barrett, Chief Corporate Learning Officer at Emory Executive Education at Goizueta Business School. Two weeks ago, I had the pleasure of moderating a conversation with two academics in very different disciplines, marketing and managerial accounting, and exploring how each thinks about growth and the underlying assumptions um, that can bring those two disciplines together. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce two academics who, whose work seamlessly blends. They can probably finish each other's sentences. <laughs> Rick Gilkey uh, is the professor in, practice of, in the practice of organization and management at Goizueta Business School. And he also holds an appointment at Emory's School of Medicine as an Associate Professor of Psychiatry. He's a recipient of the university's highest teaching honor, the Emory Williams Award. And his research has been in the area of neuroimaging, uh, which involves the use of MRI scanning technology to gain images of executives who are involved in strategic thinking, moral reasoning, create problem solving. And this research really focuses on on understanding how the brain operates in high level cognitive tasks of an executive population, and then how to facilitate these types of learning and thinking in, in others. Carl Kunert is also a professor in the practice of organization and management uh, at Emory University in Goizueta Business School, and is also a very active member of the faculty in the School of Medicine Department of Psychiatry. Carl's research focuses on how leaders cognitively, interpersonally, and emotionally develop. His recent work includes using artificial intelligence to scale expert decision-making. He teaches leadership, organization change, and professional ethics, uh, and has also been recognized with numerous awards for teaching and research. He served as a consultant and educator with many large and small corporations, as has Rick. So without uh, further ado, um, we will uh, launch into this conversation um, that really started off about talking about um, how the leaders think about uh, new sources of growth. And then over the last four months and longer for some people, um, evolved as we started to face uh, three globally significant related crises. First, the COVID-19 pandemic, then the resulting global economic crisis, and more recently, uh, the, the focus on health and financial inequality and systemic social injustice in the US. And that is now moving um, to conversations around similar issues around the world. So today we're going to explore what leaders should expect of themselves and their teams as they navigate those, those crises. So Carl, I know you have a, um, a poll for all of us. Yes, thank you, Nicola. What we'd like to do is have you go, if you're on your uh, laptop or, or device, uh, phone device, whatever you want to use here, but go to menti dot com and enter the the uh six digit code five seven zero six zero seven and the question we're asking is what are the most crucial and critical challenges you are facing as a leader in the current environment
These are great. Yeah, really, huh? Ah. Yeah, these are great. Sounds like these guys need to talk to people in the Department of Psychiatry, but I guess that's us. Wait. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> So Rick, based on these, um, and then also your research and teaching, you know, what are the most crucial and, and critical challenges that lead, that you've found that leaders are facing in the current environment? Well, certainly this multifaceted crisis that is both complex, but it's also longstanding. It's not going to go away. So it's very different than responding, as we'll discuss in a short-term crisis. I'm struck by the poll at the range of concerns, um, and this is an important uh, thing to, to note, that some of the ones are just kind of the normal things that we experience and kind of in the realm of the expected, perhaps. It's uncertainty, concern about safety. Um, and then on the other end of a continuum is just the fact that this is so easily overwhelming uh, and panic and fear and chaos. And th that level of stress makes it very difficult for us to think clearly, to pay attention to what we need to, um, and to make wise decisions. It, it, it interferes with a prefrontal cortex, if I may put it that way, um, and our highest capabilities get compromised and uh, in some cases even negated, uh, negated. The other part of that list, of course, is higher level things. Uh, how do we innovate? How do we manage financially, market share? Um, and this is both personal and professional because family concerns are a huge issue right now. Our families have been reorganized and that was not expected. Uh, and we have to renegotiate that. That also contributes to fear and anxiety and uh, can detract us from being effective either in our personal or professional life. Um, so thank you everybody for your candor in all this. And uh, these are all uh, very much in the realm of what we all need to work together to help each other uh, through because all of these are legitimate and very real uh, and you don't need us to tell you that. Um, I chose um, to focus on kind of the neuroscience part of this, and that is what's happening to us at the deepest level, which is really with our minds and our brains. And one of our highest capabilities to deal with that overwhelming list is our ability to focus. I mean, the first thing you see of this list is there's 15 things on there, and they're all important. Um, and from the highest to the lowest, to the most basic need for safety and security, to the highest need to how do we perform well as a professional or in our personal lives with our family. So um, I want to talk about focus, which interestingly enough is the title of uh, Dan Goldman's most recent book, uh, kind of spinning out of all his work on emotional intelligence. Focus is the ability that you and I need to mobilize to focus our attention. Attention is everything. Attention is the mother of memory, and it is the basis for all competent decision making. And yet it is easily compromised. We are distracted. We're overwhelmed. And it makes it in this environment, just the list that you recited, Nicola, because this is really how, what in the world do you pay attention to? We know from the literature that if somebody can pay attention to seven different things, they're world class, uh, that that's really more than we can expect. And when they're as emotionally charged as all the topics that you mentioned, 
um, it's even going to be a much smaller list that people can actually focus on. So let me just spend a couple of minutes on this. I want to focus on three domains of focus, of attention. Um, how we attend to ourselves, ourself and our family, our organizations, and then the outer world. The point I want to make about the self is that if we come here and simply tell you what you already know, that's not very helpful. I want to point out the things that seem to me to be a bit counterintuitive, particularly for this audience, because you guys are high achievers. You're concerned about other people and your organizations. Uh, you attend to other people. You care for other people. Uh, and that's well and good, but it can also work against you. One thing we know about failure and derailment is that it is often a function of people overusing a strength. Uh, and becoming burned out and compromised in ways that make them less effective. And so watch out for your strengths. But the four kind of themes I want to speak about very quickly, we are all operating from some sense of urgency. But in fact, one of the counterintuitive truths, I think, is slower is faster. I'll come back to that. Um, sometimes you're in, your immediate reaction may be the problem, not the solution. The second thing is that uh, strengths can become weaknesses. Again, if you overutilize this, uh, tending to other people, if you're neglecting your own health and even basic biology of sleep. We have a classic case at Emory, as you know, Nicola, who are a leader. This was in Haiti after the earthquake. And, the, and this person, the General Keene and our faculty, was attending to people at Haiti because he thought every moment he slept, somebody was dying and he couldn't, how could he take care of himself? And he ended up, by his own admission, becoming really ineffective at a certain point and simply had to go and get sleep and take care of himself. Um, the third one is um, what works in an immediate crisis doesn't work in a long-term crisis uh, necessarily at all. And yet we're wired to operate in an immediate mode and we have to pace ourselves and we'll come back to that one. And then finally, and consistently with this, is taking care of others uh, by taking care of yourself first uh, is a rule we really need to take seriously, um, that we need to think about sustainable pace, um, avoiding burnout. Right now, this is a huge issue in our medical system with ICUs and emergency rooms. People are just burned out. And anytime you hear somebody saying, I'm over this COVID thing, it means that they're becoming more lax about safety precautions because they're just w worn down. Uh, and you really have to attend to those people. And that's part of what we'll talk about in terms of leaders. So slower is faster is even in a crisis, you need time to reflect. You need time to slow down to get your best information and to reflect and learn on it. And it's even important to learn because if you're not learning as you go along, um, this is again, a long-term crisis and you don't want to lose the lessons and you don't want to forget them. Um, there's a saying that, uh, the brain is experience dependent, but you don't learn from experience, you learn from reflecting on experience. Um, Walt Disney was famously said that you can't learn from experiences you're not having, but the neural correlate of that is you also can't learn from experiences you're having if you don't slow down and reflect. The military's after action review is a perfect format. And uh, I'm on the board of an, uh, a private family equity firm, and we, we spend time at the end of each meeting to say, what did we learn from this that we want to carry forward? It's you're much more deliberate and conscious, and you're trying to maintain your competence in an area where you would otherwise succumb to the word that one of you used, chaos. Um, strengths can be weaknesses. Um, in other words, past successes are not a guarantee of any future successes. And in fact, using what you did before may actually be an impediment. So you need kind of reality checks and you need people to be candid and tell you the truth. And you may have to make very explicit efforts to say, you know, I need your feedback uh, in this situation because none of us are going to be at our best and we need to be supportive of each other and understand the effect we're having on other people. Um, I think the uh, taking care of, your, of others by taking care of yourself, pay attention to sleep, to food, um, it's a little bit like living with permanent jet lag. You know, sometimes you don't know if you're hungry or you're tired. Um, exercise is going to be critical. And I, I say this without the needed disclaimer that, that getting a, a, um, you know, an exercise bike that is now, you know, taking off or rowing machines or whatever you need to get, but ways of maintaining that physical health is going to be critical. Um, we, we know it affects moods, for example. And as a leader, your mood is contagious. So if you're burned out and stressed out, 
um, that's not helpful. And uh, I had a colleague in psychopharmacology who said that uh, 15 minute uh, exercise is worth two Prozacs uh, and uh, in elevating your mood and changing your outlet, outlook. And that helps other people. Um, the other domain is family. Um, you're having to renegotiate roles and expectations. Uh, and uh, this is a time where some of us rediscover our family. One of my favorite bits of kind of online humor was uh, in the second day of the lockdowns, uh, this one uh, young man wrote and said, day two, no sports. There's a young woman sitting on my sofa. I, I think she may be my wife. She seems nice. Um, so it sort of makes the point that we're sort of reconnecting and we didn't expect to be full-time partners in that sense. Um, and um, that has to be managed and even space of a family and the schedule and the time, watch out for transitions. If you've come out of Zoom meetings and now you're supposed to be on to cover for somebody else, transitions are the times then a marital therapist will tell us that are the ones where you have the worst fights and the worst conflicts. Um, so we need distance and space. We also need ways of connecting, but managing those transitions in and out um, are, um, are crucial. Um, I will share just a personal note. I was at a board meeting of the equity firm on Monday and the partners of Goldman Sachs were presenting and one of them was doing a presentation and she was absolutely spectacular. I mean, it was just a beautiful presentation. And all of a sudden everybody broke up laughing. And I think I saw every human emotion on her face because she had no idea what was going on. Behind her was swinging Spider-Man, her five-year-old son in uniform, swinging from God knows what behind her. And we had to draw her attention to the fact that the reason that people weren't attending to her presentation and were laughing was because of what was behind her. It was also a kind of reminder that some of the most important things are not right in front of us. They're uh, behind us and things we need to attend to. But... Um, apart from the charm of having attended a board meeting with Spider-Man, the fact is um, that these are very real issues. The people who have kids are under a level of stress that those of us, for example, who are empty nesters can't probably even really quite comprehend. So taking time and energy for this is important and managing your energy because the most common experience I hear about, and I think Dr. Kuhnert would say the same thing, is people saying, I don't know what I accomplished today, but I know I'm exhausted by the end of the day. It just takes a lot of energy. Don't underestimate that. Um, the other day, I didn't go and get gas in the car because I just didn't have the energy to think through the 12-step process of using gloves and sanitizer and everything else to get the gas in the car without contaminating me and the car and everything else. Um, this is taking a lot of focus. So again, managing and, and pacing yourself and your attention because it's not unlimited. So um, I'll say a little bit more about um, organizations uh, and how do you need to focus there and what you focus on in the outer world um, as we continue. But I think we're going to shift to another poll now. Uh, I thank you for your input and your words. We will keep those and it gives me a, a lot of information to think about of the kind of deep concerns that people have that are so profound and uh, uh, challenging. Thanks, Rick. So yeah, so if we can shift to our poll. Um. The, the question here is since sheltering in place due to COVID, has your stress increased dramatically? Increased? Mm, that's about the same. Or stress, what stress? Got almost everyone participating. We'll give it just another second or two. Okay, great. By the way, this is a good example of self-monitoring, which is what I was talking about. You know, pay attention to how you're feeling. That's your baseline, and it's important. All right, that's just about everybody. Looks like 43% increased is one. There we go. Oh, good, okay. Who's that? Uh, literally, <laughs> yeah. Literally 75%. Yep. Look at that. Carl, I don't know if you want to comment on that or you want me to pick up on it, but. I'll pick up on I mean, that's, that's That's about what we expected. I mean, that's when we get, when we ask this question to, you know, MBA students, I get I get about the same 75% say their, their, their life is, or their stress is really increased. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, a second poll, right? Now that we we understand that seventy five percent of you your stress is increased, the second poll here is what is the greatest source of stress for you during the pandemic? So what are the what's the greatest source of stress for you? This one looks a lot closer. Yeah, I would expect that. I would too. We... If you're lonely, we'll set up some Zoom sessions for you. You can join ours. <laughs> That'll cure that problem really fast. Yeah, it's not to make light of though. I mean, isolation is a serious issue. All right, I think that's just about everybody. Yeah, yeah. Wow, huh? Well, we're certainly going to talk about the work thing, Carl, in terms of yep. what leaders should expect of their people. So um, we're going to touch on that. But um, the well-being and the loneliness ones, I mean, again, yeah, it's attending to your to yourself um, and finding ways to uh, reach out to people. And this is a very difficult time for people who live by themselves. Um, you know, your heart goes it's, out to them. It's also very difficult for, you know, uh, folks who have elderly parents. Yeah. Different kinds of facilities. I've been seeing yeah. that as well. Everybody's yeah. afraid of that. So. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, technology can only do too much. I think so much. I think we've learned that that it's not a replacement for a hug uh, and uh, an intimate conversation. And hopefully, we're going to learn as we learn more about this vir virus. We're going to learn ways that we can socially connect by being physically uh, safely distanced, but not socially and personally. So, um, Carl, any other comments on that? No, nope. no. Nope. Okay. All right. Well, let me just focus for five minutes then on the. Uh, issue of we've talked a little bit about self and taking care of yourself and finding ways to connect on the organizational uh, level um, I'd like you to just picture what Carl just kind of asked you about which is stress and you recall the most famous chart probably in social science is a stress performance curve it's a simple bell curve and at the top is the overload point so the curve that goes up is when performance goes up stress is increased but it should you stress it's positive stress you're motivated you're inspired you're excited about work you may even be looking forward to get there getting there um and then you hit a tipping point and the tipping point occurs when you lose control and certainly COVID is a perfect recipe for losing control you just don't even know you're what, whether you're safe anymore and you're in tough territory and then you're on the right side of the curve that's the distress side and so in organizations, the trick is as a leader and as a participant, how do you stay on the left side and keep engaged and working without going to the right side? The problem with the right side is literally the cortisol, the, the stress hormones that overrun you. And they're there for a reason. They're designed to get you through a short term crisis. It works in the jungle. It does not work in the corporate jungle uh, when you've got long term uh, issues and delicate relationships that you have to maintain. So th that, the question is, how do you get yourself back? And the key variable, again, is control. In our classes that Carl and I teach, you know, that we do a pop quiz on the Indianapolis 500 race, and the time the drivers are most physiologically stressed and on the right side of that curve is when they're in the pit uh, because they don't have control, and the pit stop is very stressful. And so that's one of the things you alluded to in your statements, not knowing the long uncertainty in the future. We're all kind of in the pit waiting. So it's, you've got to become in some sense an activist. Otherwise you become a victim in this situation. So what do you do? Well, on the left side, you're motivating and inspiring and working with your teammates to, to get everybody on track and produce. On the right side, it's much more taking care of people. And I always think that on the left side, you're using your expressive skills, you're communicating messages, you're engaging. On the right side, your receptive um, skills become much more important. You gotta listen, uh, you gotta listen to people. So, um, and it's not a matter of just hearing what's said, but also hearing what's not said, as Peter Drucker said. So the example I gave from the, um, 
um, ICU units, intensive care units was good, where the leader called Carl and I and, and basically said, uh, my, my chief and my deputy in this department said, I'm over COVID. What does that mean? And what it meant was that she was compromising and giving up and not able to attend to safety procedures. Uh, we can't afford that clearly. But that was a good example of the kind of listening on the right side, making sure you're accessible and that people will tell you the truth and that you're not judging them. And that's the other thing. You have to modify your expectations. Nobody's going to perform at the same level. Um, you have to help them prioritize. And that, again, is another way of focusing. Um, and this is emotionally draining and taking care of people, encouraging them to get sleep, to create some boundaries, even if they're ones in their own houses, um, so that they can have different ways of demarcating activities and managing their relationships become really important. And a good deal of empathy. I'm not sure if the little Spider-Man incident I mentioned uh, would have been so well tolerated at Goldman Sachs before COVID, but in fact, everybody really, it was an outpouring of support for this uh, woman who's a, a great senior partner there. And it was a real show of empathy. It ended up being a very positive kind of thing. And, and again, charming. We, we do have to kind of loosen or change our expectations and provide ready support. Um, the last thing I'll say is just on the social part of this. And that is the, the, the counterintuitive message here is less is more. Information overload is your worst enemy because you are able to attend to nothing if you're hearing everything. So be very consciously selective about what news sources you listen to, when you listen to them. You know, don't look at your stock portfolio before you go to bed. In general, I don't think you should look at your stock portfolio anyway, uh, except on a just rare occasion. Um, and distill information. If you were a three-star general, like our colleague General Keene, you could immediately appoint a chief information officer to organize, screen, and titrate, and distill information for you so you only got what you really needed. None of us have that luxury, uh, likely, but so you gotta do it for yourself. Uh, and again, be very deliberate about that. And be deliberate if you are in the car, you know, this may not be the time to listen to news. It's, there's no good news coming across the airways. And you do need to pay attention to your driving. I'm finding driving very scary because two things have happened. There is somewhat less traffic. So people think they're on the Autobahn and can go 100 miles an hour. And you can just see the distraction in terms of people staying in their lane. I don't know what they're listening to or what they're doing, but it's a dangerous enterprise uh, in this. The last thing I'll say about the social part of it is uh, create a board of advisors. In these particular challenges that you put up, reach out, and this is a, uh, not a cure, but a help for loneliness. Ask people if they'd specifically be willing to talk with you occasionally about what particular issues you're dealing with. Um, and that can be anything from all of the topics you said of doing your job or managing family issues. Um, the mental health services are operating with telemedicine um, and people are perfectly comfortable just having conversations. And it's not a matter of treating mental illness, it's a matter of treating the anxiety and stress we all feel and um, people want to help each other and doesn't can be a professional but it's just as positive sometimes just to reach out to a friend or a colleague um, and uh, provide that kind of consultative support for each other uh, it's it's absolutely valuable so let me uh, transition at this point if I may Carl sure thanks Rick um, I think one of the great paradoxes of, of leadership during a time of, of, of great stress like this, whether it be the pandemic or the uh, social disruption that we're going through, is that this is the time uh, when leaders emerge. Uh, leaders actually don't emerge uh, and, 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 and leaders don't grow during times um, of tranquility. Uh, no, one, no one grows as a leader uh, by sitting on the on the couch uh, watching the Braves play, um, one of my one of my favorite uh, inspiring stories of getting through a crisis um, was was Apollo 13 uh, when the oxygen tanks failed, and the prediction was the lunar module was going to fail. Uh, Gene Kranz, who actually was the flight director. Uh, overheard others remarking that this was going to be the worst disaster in NASA history, to which <laughs> uh, Krantz responded, uh, with all due respect, 
I believe this is going to be our finest hour. And, uh, and I always think, I think about this as we go through this pandemic, that what if, what if we can make this our finest hour? And, and I'm, I'm almost certain that during this time uh, that we are going to have uh, leaders emerge um, as a result of what they've learned about themselves and what they've learned about others. Um, I can see, in fact, you, you see it <laughs> on the nightly news, and I, and I see so many, I see so many young people uh, carrying um, black, black, black lives matter signs, and 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 how, as a result of what they're doing in the way they have now come to see the world, uh, that they're literally going to be uh, our next generation of, of of leaders. And so, if if you could, Nick, I'll put that first slide up. Sure. And the way the way I the way I talk about this, and let me apologize. It's a little it's a little uh, messy, um, but I'll, I'll I'll try to clear it up. the The two ways in which in which leaders grow, and the one way we're all familiar with, which of course is what I call lateral development, which is which is learning you know through traditional means. That is you know sitting in a classroom. Um, particular learning new activity sets, skills, maybe accounting skills or finance skills. It's knowledge. I mean, it, it, it could be, you know, watching the Discovery Channel, right, and, 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 and learning. So, so we, do, we do learn this way. But the way that we, that we really accelerate development is through vertical development. And that, by the way, is through landmark events. These events actually change who we are with respect to the problem we're trying to solve. And so what do I mean by that? Is just in, in five seconds, think about landmark events in your life, right? You all have them, right? And it, it may be a birth of a child, uh, it may be graduated from college, but we can look at these, these, these events in both positive and negative, by the way, uh, that, that helped grow us. And having, having done this, essentially this activity across the world, it, it, may not, it may not surprise you when I say this, but the events that really grow us uh, is when they entail some form of loss. And that, that loss actually accelerates our development. And you can think about that and, and you think about, think about your life and what has really grown you. What, is, what has changed you enough to see yourself and others differently? Um, and we just refer to this um, as, as vertical development. Um, the thing, just to give you an example of this, um, vertical development, um, how many of you, and I, I, unfortunately I can't see your faces or your hands, but how many of you have actually um, tried to lose weight? Yeah, put up your hands, yeah, yeah. And most, I would assume that, at least in my classes, 99% uh, of the people actually put up their hands, they try to lose weight. But how do we lose weight? Uh, and what we do in, is in this country is we actually take a lateral development approach, which means that we go out and buy a book. We read the South Beach diet, we read about the keto diet. And so we're gonna use that to lose weight. In fact, what we now know is that we don't lose weight uh, when we take this vertical, or I'm sorry, this lateral development approach. Uh, and, and so if we really want to lose weight, we have to take a vertical development approach. That is, we have to change who we are with respect to the problem we're trying to solve, right? We, we have to actually uh, decide, hey, um, I need to change who I am with respect to my diet. And so what happens is when you're willing to change who you are first, uh, actually, books matter, uh, seminars work, uh, diet and exercise works. All these things start working. But the first thing that has to happen is that we have to be able to change ourselves with respect to the problem we're trying to solve. And just to give you an idea of how powerful this is, if anybody knows anybody has been through, through a 12-step program, that first step is recognizing that you are admitting that you do have a problem which is in fact a vertical development experience. In fact, we know that people really don't uh, make it through the program if they don't do that vertical development exercise first. 
changing who you are with respect to the problem. And oh, by the way, lateral development uh, and lateral development skills, those actually get you the job. But it's the vertical development that actually gets you promoted because that's what we're looking for in leaders. We're looking for them, we're looking for leaders to be more mature and we, get, we gain that maturity through experiences and oftentimes through things like this pandemic event um, or the social disruption that we're also going through. Uh, if you could also put that last slide up here. Um, I'm trying. That's all right. This is what actually uh, vertical development looks like. Um, it's imaginary. Um, <laughs> you're quick you're quick there you go <laughs> and so and so hey look I, i'm i'm not going to spend um uh, uh uh time actually going through these different levels uh but i but this is this is a a trajectory um that effective leaders go through and um those those bottom two by the way um are essentially ineffective leaders and we have more effective leaders at these, what I call leader level four and le le leader level five. And there is this, this, this huge transition. They're all transitions, by the way, going from each one of these levels. And um, in, the, in, the, in the program, the programs that we run, most of the folks uh, that are in our classrooms are actually struggling between level three and level four. And so in order to give you a sense of this, um, there is a, um, there is a story um, that I like to tell, and it's about um, the story of, of I'll, I'll call it two Lukes, <laughs> and what it, the story is that a Luke uh, works in a hospital, and, um, and what he does is he, he cleans rooms and uh, mops the floors. And uh, this is, again, while, while patients are there. In this particular instance, uh, uh, Luke, who, is, who, who visits this room every day, and there happens to be a father in there who's uh, essentially standing vigil over his son who was in an accident and, and in a coma. Um, and Luke got to know this, this gentleman, um, this father, very well and had conversations with each other as, as Luke was cleaning up the room. On this particular day, uh, uh, the uh, dad went down, actually went outside to, to, to smoke a cigarette. And he came back, he came back and he realized Luke wasn't there. And so uh, the dad went out and actually uh, tracked down Luke and if you can imagine this, uh, the dad actually called Luke out for not coming in and cleaning the room. When in fact, Luke had cleaned the room, but he had done it when the father was out for uh, a cigarette. And so I want you to think about this for a second. How does Luke respond? And let me put it, let me put it right on you. How do you respond? Well, the the way that I'll call this kind of immature leaders deal with this kind of subject matter is that you defend yourself and you say to the dad, uh, Hey, uh, I was, I, I was here. I did clean the room and you were out for a cigarette while I was, while, while I was cleaning the room. That is defend your ego, right? That that's, that's what you do at level two and level three. Well, there is, there is a second Luke here, uh, a more mature Luke, who actually, when he gets confronted with that question, well, where were you? Why weren't you here? This, this, this second Luke, the more mature Luke, understands that he's there not just to clean floors. Luke is there actually, the second Luke, this more mature Luke, is there to serve the families and to be there uh, as, a, as, 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 as part of the, of the hospital's mission, which is to serve the patients as well as their families. 
And that's exactly what he was doing. And so uh, what this second Luke did is he said, I'm very sorry, sir. Uh, I will clean the room again. And so what he realized was, again, the reason he's at in this job was to serve families and to serve the hospital, not to serve his own, his own singular interest in defending who he is and what he's about. And so um, I, I, like the, I like that story because it, rel it, it gives you a sense of, of, of two people doing the same thing, but seeing it from very different lenses. And that's what happens in this trajectory is you actually see the world differently depending on where you are in this trajectory. And there is more or less um, uh, ways uh, to be effective. And it's at these greater, le these higher levels where you're focusing on your values, who you are. You don't so much have values, but you are those values. And your focus here is, is more on transformation. And we see our greatest leaders, by the way, uh, whether it be a, a, a Martin Luther King uh, or, or uh, Abraham Lincoln, who actually were able to see uh, the whole uh, of the situation that they were in and were able to um, lead effectively through very, very uh, challenging times. So, Carl, um, yes. I'm curious in terms of, you know, in, in situations like many of us, pretty much all of us have found ourselves given the sort of this, this triumvirate of crises that we are dealing with and trying to navigate through how do we, um, how did our sort of leadership levels uh, impact, uh, get impacted through this time? Do we, we grow through that, but then also sometimes it, it feels like we also regress? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, let, let me... Let me give you what I think is, is uh, uh, for me, one of the most important lessons I learned. Uh, and, and I actually learned this from, from, a, uh, uh, from, from a general um, that I had the, the great pleasure of interviewing. And he, and he said to me, he said, he said Carl, it, it's, not, it's not what happens to you that matters. It's what happens in you. And and what we learn from that is that, look, we all experience stress. We all experience forms of anxiety. We all have things uh, that are, are um, uh, affecting us. But it's also very true that it's not those events that are causing us the, 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 the stress. It's, it's, it's actually how we want to or how we respond to that stress. Um, we, we all know people who, who, who have gone through some pretty, pretty tough times and, and they come out stronger. And it's, the reason is, is, is that it's, it's not about how it affected them. It's, it's how it, I'm sorry, it's not how, it's not the event itself. It's, it's how you experience that event. We all know people that have been through, I mean, hurricanes, and, and, and some people are actually able uh, to use that energy uh, and, and turn it into a positive. So we have the, we have the ability, like the next, the next time you're in an argument and someone is, 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 is getting you mad, you have, you have the ability <laughs> to decide for yourself uh, <clears throat> uh, how you wanna react in that situation. But there's no, there's no, there's no doubt, uh, Nicola, that some people um, that I've known uh, who, who have actually, uh, because the conditions have been too great for them, um, who have um, actually regressed. Um, and, um, and hopefully uh, they, can, they can find a place where they can, they can recover and come back. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's, again, the, the point is it's not um, what, what's happened to us, it's what happens in us. Could I just add something? One of our participants ask, what, what do you do if your top leaders are missing in action? And it seems very relevant in terms of what you asked, Nicola, about the different levels. And my implicit assumption in, in looking at their question is that what they were really doing is they kind of withdrew into themselves. 
and how do you get them back into leading the organization and helping people understand what's going on and where they're going and without knowing the case in detail you know it's a good example it seems to me Carl of your chart where they've dropped back into themselves and really level one not even level two probably in that yeah um, the, the one thought I have about that we don't know whether they're aware of the fact that they're being perceived that way and uh, one one thing to think about is is there a way that you can work with people that you connect to in your organization to send a written message to these people politely and respectfully saying that we need more guidance from you and giving them some ideas of what you would hope to get from them um and i don't know whether the, i don't know the context so i i can't say anything more specifically than that but many times the the, the challenge of leadership is the danger of getting isolated and that's especially true now uh, and so giving them the feedback that you shared with us is hey these people aren't here we don't know what's going on um, is an important message to figure out how to get it to them I mentioned written because it is less confrontational than having a direct conversation and they have to respond to it in real time on zoom that would be difficult last point and that is uh, I think I can speak for you Carl but if you have We'll, we'll have time for Q&A, but if you um, have questions or concerns like that, feel free to reach out to us via email, and I'm happy to provide a kind of private consultation as I learn a little more about your question to see if I can give you some thoughts or be a thought partner, at least in confronting the issue. I had this, um, I, I was just, this is a remarkable story. I, many of you probably remember um, Christopher Reeves, the Superman. <laughs> <laughs> and and <clears throat> he ended up uh, 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 falling off a, a horse, I believe, and became a paraplegic. Mm -hmm. And you can't imagine, I mean, it's hard to imagine much worse than that, being Superman going from being Superman to uh, uh, a paraplegic. But uh, before the end of his life, um, I, I read this story about him, and it was so remarkable that he, he said that toward, basically toward the end of his life, uh, he had never been more powerful <laughs> um, as a as a person and as a voice for handicapped people uh, 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 than than mm -hmm. what he was when he was a paraplegic uh, because he found ways he found access into government agencies and 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 <laughs> different in, in different uh, 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 hospitals where where his voice was so strong and and where he was having making a huge difference in the lives of people. And again, this was, and I have to almost say this, this was a choice he made uh, because, you know, you don't, not everyone makes that choice to decide, hey, listen, um, um, I'm more than this. <laughs> I'm more than my, uh, my disability. Uh, I, I'm more than the, 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 what, I've been, what I've been dealt with here. And uh, for, him to, for him to be able to come back and, and, and um, really make a difference in the lives of others was really, was really striking. And so, again, this is just, you know, one example of this, but I've literally, there are literally hundreds of examples that I have over the years of, of people who have overcome really great things, uh, amazing things, um, uh, to, to do wonderful things. And, and again, I really do expect this to come out of um, uh, what's going on in the country right now. Carl, we have a, another question here that I think is worthwhile asking right now. Um, it's for those of us who find that they fall into more into the category of horizontal development, the lateral development. What recommendations would you make around trying to engage more uh, into transition and in, transitioning into vertical development? Well, thank you. Well, that's actually what we do. That's what we do in our um, executive development programs. But uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, um, what we get you to do is um, actually identify what's most important to you. And let's just, let's take the example of work. What's most important to you at work? What, what values do you have um, that, that energize you, that, that make you really come to work? Well, what, we, what we, we, we ask you to do is we ask you to stay, take some really small steps in the direction of, of, of talking about those values at work. Uh, trying to live into those values and work. And these can be very, very, we actually, we demand that these steps be very small, that you take, that you engage in some experiments, very small experiments, where you find uh, your voice, find a way 
that you actually start making a difference, uh, not only uh, to, to uh, maybe uh, your direct reports, but you also start finding your, your, um, uh, your ability to actually start to move larger groups. Uh, all of this is a process, and, and believe me, there are ways we've had a great deal of success with this, with accelerating uh, people's development. Uh, you have to be open to it. You have to be willing to change. Uh, you have to be willing to take some risks. Uh, but all of this, by the way, those three things I just said, risk, curiosity, experiments, this is what great leaders do. Um, but they have to do it. They have to do it in a safe way. And, um, and as you become more comfortable, um, as, you, as you gain in confidence, uh, the more you can do, the more likely it is that you're going to uh, uh, develop more vertically as a leader. Yeah, that's a, that's a great synopsis. And I just thinking of just one addition to what you were saying and the idea of being open and taking risks is asking for, is a part of that, uh, getting feedback, asking for feedback. Oh my gosh. Um, that, that's going to be critical. And what I like about it, what you're saying too, is that pick small incremental goals and then get feedback. Are you, do people see that you're moving in that direction? And you, you have to get people who are discreet, you trust, um, and uh, who have, are perceptive. But if you find good people to do it and you launch that, then you're activating all the channels you're talking about. So clearly I, I, here. That's, we, yeah, Rick, that's absolutely true. And, and also, um, I, I'd also recommend to have a developmental partner. Um, yeah. Someone who, like you said, yeah. Rick, can really give you that feedback. Um, and, it, and it may be, it may be a, su a supervisor. It may be a, a, look, it may be, it may be a direct report. Uh, i like, I like getting feedback from direct reports, uh, especially those who I feel like have a great potential <laughs> in, in, yep, in yep. the company. Uh, but you can also ask your spouse um, as well. But it, 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 development is really uh, hard to do on your own uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're, because we're, everything is so urgent in front of us that we don't think about what we need to do for ourselves to, to help ourselves grow. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, feedback is so important. So important, Rick, to our own development. It's a pri yeah. one of the primary ways in which we grow is through feedback. Yeah. Yeah. So, so building on that, um, that's about self. How do you help members of your team to also grow vertically? It's, it seems easy to help them grow laterally, but, but helping them grow vertically and seeing that that is where um, uh, the, the, the most potent growth comes from. Yeah, and I and I and and if you're the if you're the leader of that group, I think it's very very important to have these very very tough. I mean, tough, and and being very deliberate in in creating a culture where that feedback is is flying all the time. Understanding, hey, listen, we haven't arrived yet. <laughs> <clears throat> There is this difference. We all have this difference between who we are and who we want to be. <laughs> and, and we're trying to close that gap all the time. And so having, having a, a culture um, that, that, that provides a lot of feedback with the understanding is that, look, we're, this feedback, we're not doing it just to you know, decide who gets the bonus this year. This is, this is daily, weekly feedback that we're having with people with the idea is, hey, listen, we all got to get better at this. I mean, this is what you're talking about here is, is creating a high powered uh, team yeah. when you can do this, yeah. when you're all growing together. Yeah, that seems to me to be the key dynamic. Once you do this, it becomes contagious. You kind of set a new norm on the team that you're going to listen to candid feedback and use it. And it's pretty hard for people not to start reciprocating. Um, and you could even prompt them to do it and say, what can I help you with? Uh, so I think, I, I think you're talking about a positive social contagion that uh, really makes a difference. That's exactly right, Rick. And so um, just sort of coming to a, to, to a last question um, and building on that, Rick, around, you know, culture, organizational culture, which feels like it's under um, pressure at the moment, given many organizations are, are, we're working differently, our business models are changing, um, the pressures on these organizations are changing. Um, so how do we, any thoughts about how do we build, maintain 
a positive culture through this. Um, so, so how is leaders yeah. do we help do that? Yeah, well, you, you're raising a great question, of course. And, you know, the, part of the answer, and it was one of the words that people use in that initial poll, is sort of the chaos, is that, in fact, it's, it's not going to just get cleaned up and changed quickly. We are going to have to go through some chaos as we really reevaluate and renegotiate who we are, even as a nation, as a culture. Um, I, the word you use, regression, is a very powerful and useful concept because we think of regression as backsliding and becoming incompetent when in fact it's not. It's going back and shoring things up. And if you look at Carl's model, you know, the first stage is self. It's perfectly appropriate to go back and say, okay, let me think about how I'm managing myself uh, and strengthening yourself. So regression can be powerful and the hard part is tolerating it because of all the words that people had up there it's scary it's uncertain it's unpredictable um i don't think we have a choice right now um and and frankly um you know when we talk about the social injustices we're confronting in our society as you mentioned organizations we've got to go and look at our own organizations and our own culture and see in what way are we sustaining unfair privileges and putting people at a disadvantage based on gender or race or whatever um, and if we're willing and have the strength, and this is where leadership really steps up and Carl's model is so useful. If we're really committed to transformation, that highest level of change that's based on our values, then we have to have, protect people and sponsor and support people to have different kinds of conversations and dialogue to rethink and renegotiate who we are um, in a fundamental kind of way. And I think that's part of the source of, of Carl's legitimate optimism. That this is a great opportunity to think about how we evaluate people and different kinds of biases that have heretofore kind of remained unchecked as we've made decisions about promotions and hiring and all kinds of things. Um, so I think the culture is unstable, it is scary, but I, my thought is as long as you attend to your values um, yeah. and are truthful um, and work to sustain trust by being consistent and predictable in this, you know, leaders not only get through this, uh, everybody in this audience, but they help other people, going back to Carl's comment about how you create a kind of positive social contagion. Uh, so I, I think that's part of the answer is, again, tolerating it. And remember that we, it's very easy to say, well, we have to learn new ways. Learning means temporary incompetence. Um, and we have to tolerate that. Uh, we're not going to have all the answers and leaders aren't, which is probably the reason that some of you are saying my leaders are missing in action. You know, we need to encourage them to come back out and regain their voice. Probably all of us have to refine our voices because it's not a different world. It's a different world and we can't operate the way we did before. We are rediscovering ourselves. Uh, hey, and, and Rick, I'll just, let me just add to this. And you know what, in this reimagined workplace and maybe yeah. a reimagined society after all this, yeah. uh, that look we're going to make mistakes yeah. Right? yeah and i that's part of that culture right is yeah. is that look we we are we are going to make mistakes we are going to fall but I, I i'm reminded that you know how is it that we learn to ride a bike right, right. Well, we learn to ride a bike by falling in fact balance isn't something that we intrinsically have it's something that's actually learned but we don't mm -hmm. learn it without skinning our knees, yeah. right? And it's that skinning of our knees that helps us learn how to balance. Yeah. And, and, and we have to be able to, again, I think in this, in this reimagined workplace, we're gonna have to experiment, right? We're gonna have to deal with our suppliers. We're gonna have to deal with our customers actually quite differently. Yes. And we realize yeah. this in education. We're gonna have to deal with, with our customers, which are students, very differently. Uh, as a result of, of this pandemic. And yeah. so we are going to make mistakes, but we're going to have to pick ourselves up and get back on that bike and, and yeah. realize this is, this is the process that we're going to have to go through. But I like the idea of uh, the expression of, 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 of falling upward <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. rather than failing, right? Yeah. And, and, yeah. and we, we have to get that message across uh, to our leaders. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And as you were saying, it's all about resilience. That's a, probably a good place to end. <laughs> mm -hmm. so thanks, Rick, and thanks, Carl. As someone who uh, seems to be constantly stubbing toes and grazing knees, uh, <laughs> it, it's uh, it, it's been a pleasure to uh, to have this conversation with you, Lane. Yeah. Yeah, thank you.
Yes, thank you so much. I just want to echo our thanks to um, all my colleagues for coming together today to share your knowledge and expertise. Um, this has been a great conversation. And just a reminder to our participants, we are going to be sending uh, the full recording out to everyone, as well as a reminder for our next uh, partner series, which is going to be July 28th. And we'll be sending some details on that. So thank you very much for joining us. Come back soon. And everyone keep washing your hands and stay well. Take care. Hmm.